Welcome to the Strong for Life podcast. I'm your host, Connor O'Shea, and I really appreciate you tuning in. If you are enjoying these episodes, I'd really appreciate you taking a moment and rating it five stars on Spotify or on Apple or whatever podcast platform you use. This is going to allow more people to find this information. Welcome to today's episode. And after 11 years of coaching people, this is probably the most important thing that I tend to talk about with clients and educate them on. It's also something that I need to keep hearing myself as well. And it's around mindset and self-compassion because you need both of them to actually get through everything. And normally it's people's heads and how they think and talk to themselves is what actually derails their results, not the results themselves. So the, the physical training tends to be fine with most people once they get proper programming, once they get something that doesn't make things worse by just smashing their bodies and actually is an educated way to train them. The only thing holding them back tends to be how they view challenges when they arise, because the reality is you can't go through anything in life, in particular training, I think is a great example, without failure. Failure is just very, very common. It's part of the journey. And you need to understand how to deal with failure when it comes up, and also how to speak to yourself. Because I think if we spoke to ourselves, like, or if we spoke to our friends or family, like we speak to ourselves, we would have no friends or family left. Okay. So today we're going to be focusing on the mindset side of things and around managing expectations and then tying them together with self-compassion. So how to actually deal with stuff in a compassionate way and not in a kind of fluffy way that doesn't really make sense or in an esoteric way. And I'm actually going to break down self-compassion. So it actually should make sense for you. Okay. So we're going to jump right into mindset guys. The first thing I talk to clients about is the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So this is all from Carol Dweck. She has a fantastic book called Mindset. And I think this book should be in all schools. I wish that someone taught me this when I was in in, in high school and secondary school. And basically the overview is that someone with a fixed mindset believes that regardless of what they do, they're fixed in this situation. So I'm just bad at languages. I'm just stiff and tight all the time. I will never be flexible. I'm just really weak. I'll never get strong. I'm just not good at maths. And these are all fixed mindsets. You think that this is just the way you are. There's nothing that you can do. And this is also very disabling because you kind of become apathetic. You don't actually have any drive because what's the point? You know, it's not going to make a difference anyway. Having a growth mindset means that, hey, you know what? I'm actually not very, well, I don't remember being very good at languages in school, but I actually didn't really apply myself either. And maths, once things got difficult, I actually kind of just opted out and the teacher wasn't good. And I've never really done flexibility training and I've never really followed a strength program before or had a coach. So I'm guessing, look, if I actually get someone who has successfully helped people like me get strong, learn languages, get better at maths, I'll probably improve as well because like I'm not an outlier. I think I just haven't applied this stuff consistently. And as a result of that, I'm not good at it. So this would be an example of a growth mindset. And the thing is, we have we have a growth mindset and a fixed mindset in, in parts of our lives. All of us as a default, even the most negative people in the world, there's probably a few things that they think that they're good at. And that's because they've applied a growth mindset. There is an element as well of just natural ability, of course, like regardless of how much I practice handstands, I will never compete for Ireland in the Olympics. I just am not good enough. Um, And some other people I know who were childhood gymnasts or whatever, uh, they will always be better than me. Okay, same with music, same with languages, all these things. But I know that if I apply consistently uh, show or if I apply consistent practice to these areas, I'll improve upon them. The same with my business, the same with my training, the same with this year I'm learning Spanish. And guess what? I'm a lot better at Spanish now after seven months of practice than I was seven months ago because I've practiced. Okay. And it's the same with your training. It's the same with every single thing in your life. Everything is a skill that you can get better at. Of course, you're not looking at becoming the 1% of the world. You're looking at getting better of the previous version of yourself at that thing. Okay. But you just need to actually open up to 
going through that phase of not being very good okay and that brings us on to the next point around the first 20 hours this is from josh kaufman and he talks about there's 20 hours and there's 10,000 hours so you've probably heard of it takes 10,000 hours to become a complete master so think of the best musicians in the world the best athletes the best business people they have done at least 10,000 hours along with natural ability, and they are world-class at it. With the first 20 hours, he makes the argument that it takes about 20 hours to become somewhat proficient at something. So you do 20 hours of Spanish, you can probably hold a basic conversation, order some food in the shop, say thank you, and so on and so forth. If you do 20 hours of handstands, you can probably hold a handstand at that point against a wall maybe, but you can Basically, you're proficient at the basic mechanics of the movement. The same with playing the guitar. You do guitar practice for 20 hours, you're going to be better. The example I like to use around 20 hours is meditation. Meditation is something I think that everyone knows they should do it or they've heard it's going to be good for them, but few people actually maintain the practice. Because if you are anything like my approach, when I started meditating back in like 2012, 2013, I would do it for five minutes, two or three times a week. I do it for three or four weeks. And I was like, this is just really hard. This is uncomfortable and I'm really bad at it and it's not for me. So again, if we do 10 minutes of meditation three times a week, that's a half an hour. And if after a month we quit, that's two hours of total meditation practice. So you've done two hours, not 20 hours. So of course, you're not going to be good at it. So this teaches you to manage expectations and to embrace being bad at something for much longer than you probably are giving yourself the option or opportunity to do. On the other side of it, if you wanted to check out meditation as a practice, you would maybe make a commitment to meditate 10 minutes a day, six days a week. That's an hour a week. And you're going to show up for 20 weeks, which is almost half a year and meditate six days a week. And then you can reassess at the end of that time. But chances are you're going to be probably in a position where you're pretty consistent and you're probably feeling some decent benefits from it at that point. Okay, so I find this super helpful for just managing expectations around how long things take and also how much time you're giving yourself before you make up your mind that you're naturally not good at it. Okay, so it ties back into that fixed mindset approach as well. And I think it's very, very helpful for helping clients and hopefully you manage your expectations. The next framework is from James Clear. He has an amazing book called Atomic Habits, and he's an incredible newsletter and website. And it's called Never Miss Twice. This is super helpful, in particular for nutrition. I think this is where people really derail themselves, but you can do it with anything, training as well. But let's just say you have set the habit on Monday. I'm going to go off sugar, no refined sugar. So clearly stuff with refined sugar in them. I'm going to cut it out like chocolate bars or whatever. And then you're doing everything well. You're doing well for two weeks. You're 100% compliant. And then Friday night comes around and you're just really stressed and you have a Snickers and an ice cream. And then you say you've failed miserably. Screw it. It's Friday. I'm just going to go on an absolute blitz. And then just, you know, it's the weekend. Saturday, go crazy. Sunday, go crazy. Gets to Monday and you're like, oh my God, I've ruined everything. I'm just going to quit completely. What Never Miss Twice helps you to understand is that it's not about streaks, meaning you need to get every single day in a row, which a lot of apps can lead you to to follow that process. It's about overall percentage, because if you did two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and you miss a day, you're still in like the 95% percentile, which is exceptionally good. And Never Miss Twice teaches you to just get back on the wagon the next day. So you break your whatever rule that you said you were going to create for yourself. And then it's Friday and you're like, okay, I'm, I didn't do the thing I said I was going to do, but I will start again tomorrow or even start again on the next meal. Okay. So if you wake up and you have donuts, <laughs> you can have a better meal at lunchtime. Okay. So never miss twice. And you can scale this out longer as well. You have a bad week, get back on next week. You have a bad month, get back on next month. Okay. The biggest thing is just, it's not as big a deal as you're making it out to be, but you berating yourself and punishing yourself for the next six months will make it a big deal. But having a mess up once, twice, three times a week, big weekend, you go on a wedding, summer holidays, 
you eat all the wrong things on summer holidays, you drink too much, no problem. Just start again when you get back. It's not a big deal, okay? Next is the rule of five from Dan John, who is a legend in the fitness industry. And he's been coaching people for over 40 years. The guy really knows his stuff. He's written eight or nine books at this point, and he's just a complete legend in the fitness industry. And he's saying after coaching people for so long, he sees a pattern of, and coaching himself, training himself for over 50 years, that out of about five workouts, one will feel great, one will suck, and three will just be neutral. Like, he didn't really feel anything happened or shifted. So again, managing expectations, this guy is worth listening to out of everyone in the fitness industry. He has the hours and the reps put in. So if only over the next month, 20% of your workouts feel like something was actually going well, you're actually right on track. Okay. I think a lot of the times working with clients, I fall into this trap as well. You don't feel awesome training or you feel like you're dragging your feet to the gym or to whatever activity you're doing and you feel like you're doing something wrong. And then sometimes that will lead you to quit. But the reality is you're most likely on the same path as pretty much everyone else out there. But your expectation of how it should feel is just a bit skewed and flawed. Okay. So if one in five, 20% of the workouts feel decent, 60% feels like you don't really think anything's registering and 20% feel awful, you're actually on the right path. Okay. So that's just, again, managing expectations. This is all this mindset stuff is about is actually being realistic about what long-term compliance looks like. The final kind of mindset piece that I like to share with clients is this quote from GMB Fitness. So it says, inspiration is best served with a side of realism. The path to greatness starts with sucking and spending an awful lot of time in mediocrity. You have to allow yourself to suck if you ever want to be great. And this, it's really tricky because that first 20 hours of doing something that you've never done before, you're going to be bad. You're going to suck at it. And it's very uncomfortable. And I wish that I could just skip all that. The example I have now currently is I'm going back salsa, bachata dancing. This is something I did probably five or six years ago. I love the dance. I think it's really enjoyable, but I'm really bad at it at the moment. And I kind of don't want to go through this discomfort. But the alternative is to just not do it, which I will be very upset if I don't do that. And you just have to go through being bad and feeling uncomfortable to actually improve upon it. So it's always good to reflect upon that quote as well. And at gmb.io, if you want to learn more about GMB, I'm a lead trainer with them. They make amazing programs, amazing community, and just overall awesome people. Now, <clears throat> The last part of this is self-compassion. When I first heard self-compassion, I thought it was this kind of fluffy yoga, esoteric phrase that people were talking about. It didn't really make any sense. And I, I didn't really know how to apply it or how it would work for me. But again, like the don't miss twice rule that we were talking about earlier, a lot of the times you mess up, which is very, very normal. Everyone does. And then you can't accept that you messed up. So you just punish yourself for weeks or months or sometimes years, unfortunately. And you just keep sabotaging yourself because you failed and you can't see I'm such a failure. I'm a piece of crap, whatever. And having self-compassion really, really helps to actually understand how to get back on the wagon really quickly and not hate yourself when you inevitably fail because failure is part of success. So Instead of just saying, yeah, just love yourself more, just be kind to yourself, I don't find those phrases helpful at all because what if you don't know how to love yourself or be kinder to yourself or forgive yourself? And that's the way I felt until I started understanding this framework and it was much more accessible to me. And I think my clients find it very helpful as well. Hopefully you will too. So this is all from Dr. Kristen Neff. She's in, I think she's in Austin, Texas. She's a researcher on all things self-compassion. So you can look her up for a more of a deep dive. And she breaks self-compassion into self-kindness versus self-judgment. So you're focusing on self-kindness, common humanity instead of isolation, and then mindfulness instead of over-identification. So how to break those things down so they make even more sense to you is that excuse me, when, when you inevitably fail, which you will, um, instead of 
basically judging yourself harshly like you're a piece of shit you did it again it's like okay cool i'm gonna actually practice self-kindness like if my friend messed up what would i do i'd be like hey man you know it's you're actually doing really well and everyone messes up and this is just a blip on the radar if you if you keep going you're going to be fine but beating yourself up is not actually helping at all so yeah of course reflect learn like maybe why this happened but just keep moving forward all right so that's more of a self-kindness approach common humanity versus isolation is probably the most powerful one i found I think I heard Mark Manson talk about this first in his book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And basically it's understanding that when you mess up, and and I find this really good for anything, however I'm feeling, all these things, common humanity means that the way I'm feeling right now, the mistakes that I made right now or previously, there's literally millions of people feeling the same way as I'm feeling right now in the world, like millions. That is crazy. And a lot of the times when we do something, we'll feel like, Uh, you feel isolated like I'm the only person feeling this way I'm the only person who messes up like this I'm the only person who keeps screwing up or keeps you know can't stick to anything don't follow through da 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 and when you realize that you're actually not the only person there's probably millions of other people out there feeling exactly the way you feel it's much easier to actually move forwards and forgive yourself so common humanity versus isolation The final one is mindfulness versus over-identification. So again, mindfulness, the example that they gave would be holding one's painful thoughts and feelings and balanced awareness rather than over-identifying with them. So to make that a bit more, I think, easier to understand the way I explain it to clients is like, let's just say on Friday night, uh, you find it really hard not to drink a lot of wine and and binge on corn chips okay and you're like oh my god just every friday i'm just i can't i can't help myself uh, this is just the way i am so you're kind of over identifying with that behavior on fridays when you speak to yourself like that or speak to your friends family loved ones whatever applying mindfulness would be like okay on fridays okay just on reflection every friday this is just a pattern i'm seeing um on fridays And I'm also very overwhelmed throughout the week. And I think once I finish work on Fridays, I need something to release the valve. Red wine is amazing for that. I also just want something to pacify myself with. So I just eat and drink because I'm so burnt out and stressed from the week. And I just want to switch off. And that's my way of self-regulating. So maybe what I can practice over the next week is giving myself more time during the week. Um, maybe checking in with boundaries around work or around like how I can give myself more space, whether that's with my training or my plan, or I might just try and be more efficient and productive with my work. So I'm not just spending three hours a day on social media and then scrambling to get my work done. So that's a more mindful approach versus just over-identifying with the behavior. So this is the overview of self-compassion. And I think breaking it into self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness is just way more powerful than just saying, oh, just be kinder to yourself or just be nicer to yourself. So that in conjunction with the mindset side of things that I've just gone through is super powerful to help you stay consistent long-term when difficult times come up because you're going to fail, you're going to mess up, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to feel dumb. That's very normal behavior to succeeding in the thing you want to get at Uh, whether that is whatever dancing for me or learning a language or for you you might feel that way you might be amazing at dancing but you might feel that way around nutrition and training and and mobility work which is my wheelhouse and i feel super comfortable in those environments so again we're focusing on a growth mindset over a fixed mindset not being perfect, but just bringing awareness to where I'm feeling like I'm boxing myself off and becoming fixed about nothing. There's nothing I can do. Then managing your expectations around how long things take with a 20 hour rule. And this is most likely meaning that you are going to give things more time and have more patience because you're probably nowhere near 20 hours. Then we want to focus on don't miss twice, embracing the suck and also the rule of five. So one and five are going to feel good. One are not going to feel good at all. And three are going to be kind of neutral. Okay. And then finally, self-compassion. So when you, that critic is really, really, you know, telling you you're a piece of work and X, Y, and Z, 
self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness is just going to bring things back into perspective. And the last activity you can do, which I do with my clients, is, and we can run through this right now. So if you just close your eyes, and of course, if you're driving, don't do this. But think of a time recently where let's just imagine that things are going well for you. And a friend has struggled. He's doing, he's just started a routine last month and he, he went to a wedding summer holidays and like, he just, he's just been really, you know, too much alcohol, too much food. And he feels he just kind of wrecked his progress. Okay. And you know, he was doing well up until this. He was probably training for eight weeks before then. And now he's just kind of like, man, I think I've just wasted the, the first eight weeks because I feel like I'm back to square one. And I just want to pack it in. And you're in a good place. You're feeling good. You've been in a routine. You've got a tan. <laughs> so just kind of visualize how you would talk to him. What's your tonality like? What type of language are you using? And what are you trying to tell him? Like you tell him, yeah, you're right. You're a piece of shit, man. You've ruined everything. Get lost. Or are you like, it's a month out of your life you've been doing great just get back on the wagon it's not a big deal you've got it you know just let's let's train tomorrow or we can go for a walk today no problem now in the second example i want you to remember the last time that you messed up it might have been today it might have been yesterday it might have been last week it was probably pretty recent and i want you to think about again what was that conversation like what was the tonality like? What was the language that you were using like? And I just want you to feel all of that. And just pay attention. Was it a similar conversation where you were most likely with your friend, empathetic, understanding, positive, upbeat, and motivating him for you know getting started again? Or was it how you are the worst person in the world, you're a piece of crap, and you should just hide from the world? Okay, if you're answering like me and a lot of other people, it was probably the latter. <laughs> and unfortunately, we are just super harsh in ourselves. But again, it's just bringing more awareness to what that internal dialogue is like and being a bit kinder because even though you might feel like, oh, but if I'm kinder to myself, then I'm going to let myself off the hook and then I'm not going to be as, you know, motivated. And it's like, well, OK, but like, how's that been working for you? You know, you're if you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s and you're breaking yourself every time that you do something wrong in your eyes, how's that been working for you? Most likely it's not been very helpful because you push yourself even harder with that inner critic and then that leads to more extreme workouts, more extreme nutrition approaches, which lead to injury, burnout, more failure, and then an even harsher critic. So maybe it's time to try a different approach if this, again, has not been working for you very well. Okay, so that is it for today, guys. Mindset and self-compassion after 11 years of working with people, after training myself for 16 years. This is the most important piece of the puzzle. The more you can focus on this stuff, the better your results are going to be long term.